Warning, this video contains spoilers for a majority of significant events throughout Amphibia. Please proceed at your own risk. Well, it happened. Amphibia has come to a close after all these years. And in all honesty, Andrew still remains, at least to me, one of the most interesting characters on the show, which ultimately led to him being my favorite when the show ended. I've already made a video touching on Andrew's character in the past in my one villain a scene video, which I seriously can't thank you all enough for the support that that video has gotten. It still blows my mind how well it did. And many of you after the show had ended went back to that video's comments to tell me that I should do a follow-up video since we've now gotten a lot of new insight to Andrew's with season 3. So, I was kind of split on what I wanted to do next. I wanted to do a video discussing Season 3 to keep the sort of series I have going, but I also wanted to keep you wonderful viewers happy in watching my content. So, I did what every reasonable person does. I left it up to the YouTube polls and Twitter to decide. And yes, I do have a Twitter, go check it out if you want. I just post random stuff from time to time, and who knows, if you get there, you may have the chance of deciding what the next video I work on may be, like how I did as a part of this little pickle I was in. So, inevitably, the winner was an Andrew's follow-up video. So, here we are. But don't worry, the Season 3 script is coming, I promise. So, without further ado, let's dive back into the legacy of Amphibia's infamous King Andreas. Andreas, as we saw him in Season 2, always seems to have this sense of pride or purpose as we witness that he has a desire to get the box in his hands, being the major motive for his mysterious actions throughout this period of the show. So, where did that sense of pride and desire for the box originally come from? Well, we get that answer and more in Season 3. It's brought through this season that we actually get a hands-on look at the story that Andreas originally told in True Colors. The story of how he was betrayed by his friends in the past, how he lost the box, and what he and his society was like before losing it. All in the episode, The Core in the king. Through the power of flashbacks, this is where we see Andrus in his youth and has yet to be given the role of king of Newtopia, still only its prince. Before he was given this massive responsibility of being Amphibia's ruler, we see that while he still had a sense of freedom, he's shown to have grown a strong bond with Beryl the Toad, a member of the Newtopian Royal Guard, and Leaf the Frog, Newtopia's gardener. In the early course of the episode, we see how much he enjoys his time with both Leaf and Beryl, laughing cheerfully, having fun in games, and just being able to have a smile on his face. Andrus even went out of his way to have someone make a painting of the three of them together just to show how much he cares about the bond that he has with them, and also as a token of his appreciation towards them, since he says he's finally brave enough to take on a big assignment for the good of their kingdom, which he claims he never could have done without their support. These early scenes of establishing Andrus' strong bond with his friends in the past is what gives us part of the context behind his legendary line of true colors. That's the thing about friends, isn't it? The more you love them, the more it hurts when they go. We've witnessed through these events of the past that Andrus indeed did love the relationships he's had with his friends, but because of this, we also learn that we're about to witness what he meant behind the pain he intended from the rest of that line. And due to the standard nature of the show, the source of that pain is about to occur despite these good and fun time events of the episode so far, the infamous Calm Before the Storm. We continue to see how much he appreciates being with his friends, until King Aldrich, his father, comes into the picture. Aldrich in the next scenes after his intervention speaks somewhat passive-aggressive to Andrus as we see how the king and prince interact with one another. Aldric, through his lines of dialogue in these moments, seems to actually despise how Andrus has a form of friendship with others he considers below his son's status. Don't you think it's time to say goodbye to those childhood friends of yours, son? Our friendship is true. Friendship doesn't last, son. It's also shown in this episode and through his father's insight that this is the first time Andrus came to know the existence of the core, the collective consciousness of his ancestors and the true mastermind behind all the success in their conquest, the being behind their society being where it is now. And this is also when Aldrich informs his son that he is to lead their next mission, which is to completely eradicate the population of Ur so they can take its resources for themselves. Upon hearing this, Andrus initially questions his decision of wiping out an entire species, the first time we see his hopeful moral compass before his inevitable attitude of king that we see in season 2 of the show. But Aldrich forces away his worries and questions of their morality, and showing his ideology of doing the wrong things for the right reasons by saying, Invading other worlds is expensive, and we need all the resources we can get. For our way of life to continue, this kind of work needs to be done. And Aldric finally passes down the key to the music box to Andrews, and with it, the responsibility of carrying on his ancestors' work. All the while, every eye in the room is focused on the small prince, as they expect great things from him to live up to their legacy and pride. Andreas, still vowing his attachment with his friends despite getting this massive responsibility, desires to share what he's obtained through this new position with his friends, since as he said earlier in the episode, he believes he couldn't be where he is now without them. So, now that he has access to the box and his functions, he wishes to share some of the glory with them since he believes they deserve it as much as he does. But, little did he know that because of this action, the course of his friendship with 
both Barrel and Leaf, and also, the entire course of Amphibia's history and future would never be the same. <laughs> Leaf expresses terrible concern to Andrews after having her vision, even telling him in desperation that if he continues to use the box, their home may be in danger, and there may not be a kingdom or land left to call home. Andrews, seeing the fear in his friend's eyes, believes in Leaf's words and has her tell his father, the king, of what she saw, and asks him in an attempt to avoid this terrible fate she's witnessed, for the good and safety of their home, to put an end to their expeditions and to stop using the box. Aldrich initially shows interest in her story concerns, but pushed by the interests of the core, his past ancestors and their greed, and how they have the ideology of doing a necessary evil for the good of their society and people, disregards Leaf's accusations. He is outraged that someone as simple as a gardener would dare state that they should just give up on the one thing that put their society where it is today and tell him, the king, what to do. You speak of fate and warnings, but the stones are our sacred birthright. They are unique to our world and proof that only we are destined to conquer. But, your majesty... Silence! It's through these words that Andrus is forced into a struggle. Because of what Leaf said against Aldrich and proposing to change their current state of society, the king believes her to be a traitor. Andrus tries to defend his friends since he states that she's only worried about their home, but Aldrich once again brings up a reason to Andrus to only focus on his new responsibility to their people and move on from his friends. It won't be long before those two start asking for favors using you. You've had that key less than a day and suddenly your friend wants to dictate how we use the most powerful object in the world. I warn you about this. It won't be long before I join the core, son. Our people will be counting on you. After Aldrich leaves him with this statement, Leaf comes to Andrus and hope that her friend already knows to do the right thing. But Andrus, still influenced by the words of his father, replies to Leaf with this. It's not that simple, Leaf. Our society is built on these expeditions. Andrus, as we previously have seen him, does generally care about the relationship that he has with both Laryl and Leaf, but he also doesn't want to have the feeling that he's failing what both his father and their people expect of him through this new responsibility of leading their conquest, the action that allows their society to be the glorious place it is. Through the pressure of this choice between his friends and his legacy, combined with how much Leaf and Aldrich are pushing him, Andrus finally snaps. Look, Leaf, maybe you should just focus on gardening and leave the ruling to me. Okay. Ooh. This is eventually what led Leaf to taking matters into their own hands and goes behind Andrus's back to steal the box. Cause it seems like this is the first time through their friendship that Andrus wouldn't listen to her. The first time that she didn't see her friend. She only saw the king's son. Despite how much she still cares about Andrus, because of just how frightened she is from her vision, she has to put that aside to do the right thing. Even if it means stabbing her friend in the back. Andrus is enraged at the sight of Leaf doing this and tries to stop her. Soon enough, he comes across Beryl and tells him the truth. What's the ruckus? Leaf has betrayed us. The way Andrew says this to Beryl makes it appear that he's not just convincing his friend, but also to himself that Leaf had indeed done this. Leaf, his greatest friend and companion, had actually betrayed him. Andreas, along with Beryl on his side, do make an attempt to prevent her from escaping with the box. As she does, Beryl does manage to get ahead of Leaf for a brief moment, but because of how Beryl still cares about Leaf as a friend, and seeing that she's gently scared of what might happen from what she saw in her vision, he stutters and lets Leaf get around him, which once again infuriates Andreas. Despite their best efforts to stop her, Leaf escapes Newtopia, and she seeks out the Ohms, the people of Amphibia that take part in fate and prophecy, to find a means to take the box as far away as she could to keep it out of the royal family's reach. The Kingdom of Utopia eventually finds out about the news, and Andreas, consumed by a sense of failure and responsibility of being the box's guardian, states to both his king and his father that he'll do everything he possibly can to undo this wrong. But Aldra claims that there's nothing left that he can do. The box is now beyond their reach. He truly has failed. However, the core tells them that there is a prophecy that says the box would return in time, but how and when is unknown, so they'll just have to wait until that time comes. But, despite the new hope that Andrus has just been given, the chance to make things right with time, Aldrich still ensures his son that he knows his place. We will bury and preserve our glorious civilization until our birthright has returned to us, and only then can you begin to redeem yourself. And those words would sting him for over a thousand years to come. Andrus vents his rage after what Leaf did, and we see the first glimpse of his inevitable tyrannic nature with these words. 
Her and her kind will need to be kept in line. And this is also where he expresses his disappointment in Beryl for failing him when he needed him most. So much that one of the first orders he gives with this king-like attitude that has been forced on him is sending Beryl, his friend, away. Andrus in this moment, fueled by his purpose to only achieve success now after failing responsibility placed on him, no longer sees Beryl as a trustworthy companion. He only sees a failed soldier. Now consumed by this new hatred of how his friends have failed his newly intensified ideology of him living up to the throne, he tears the painting that was once a symbol of their bond with his own hands. Throughout the course of these events of this one episode, we no longer see Andrius, the prince that had shared a strong connection with others and had a caring heart to other beings' lives. We now only see Aldrich's son inheriting his ancestors' behavior and pursuit of tyranny. These new insights with the events of the past, of how Andrus came to be the king he is now, changes our perception of what occurs throughout season 2, and specifically in the episode True Colors. Now that we know Andrus was fueled by the pain of betrayal, but also being pressured through the expectations of his father and ancestors, we can now look at his behavior as simply doing his best to not disappoint his father and ancestors' expectations of him again, to make it up to him for losing everything that they had, which falls back to this line. I can finish the work my ancestors started. Not his work, his ancestors work. Now the new reason he felt proud and cocky towards our protagonist was because he finally got back what he wanted, his chance to redeem himself to the core and his father for losing the one thing that kept their legacy alive, the chance to finally fulfill his responsibility placed on him, to continue on his ancestors' legacy of conquest. Through the pressure of what his peers expects of him, he's now come to look at his connections with others not as a bond that he can appreciate and enjoy, but rather something to exploit to get what he really needs, and we witness that through the show's second season as we see him interact with our main protagonist, Anne. He this initially shows a sign of a friendly bond as they first meet, and with this happy attitude of wanting to help Anne and Marcy get back home. But the more and more we get to know Andrus behind the scenes, and finally shows his true nature to Anne's true colors, we just see how much he disregards her despite how he treated her, and how much she's done for him. Because of the pressure placed on him through his responsibility as king, Andrus now sees others as an opportunity to exploit them to carry out his plans, or simply, pieces of his game. A game that he's determined to do anything to win. This corrupted ideology placed on him continues on into the infamous action of him corrupting his new friend Marcy, manipulating her to do his bidding, telling her friends the truth of her motives, and literally stabbing her in the back. Andrus throughout the course of the episode True Colors was corrupted enough by his pride as king that he was willing to toy with Marcy and make her have the feeling of betrayal, but never did anything to physically harm her, since throughout the course of the season, he's seen to gently enjoy Marcy aside as a friend while she grew to the world of Amphibia, an exception from his other connections we've seen him have throughout the show. But then, he saw her steal the box, the one thing that he worked throughout this entire season and a majority of his life to achieve. So, once again, he's been forced into a pressured situation, either keep his value for the friend he's grown to have and lose the box again, or fight for the box and forever lose his friend in the process again. This is literally the exact same form of pressure that Leaf and Aldrich placed on him centuries before. Andrus, through the pressure of his responsibility and his connections, had to make the choice of either losing Leaf or losing the box. And like he did in the past, he wasn't going to let his desire for friendship be the one thing that makes him fail in living up to the expectations placed on him. Not again. So, he made his choice. <laughs> Andrus, for the events of our protagonist finally fighting him, never wanted to do anything to hurt Marcy. But once again, being put in the situation of losing his responsibility because of a friend, which occurs because of the responsibility of his ancestors' legacy being forced upon him, he thought to himself that he wasn't going to be a disappointment twice. Through the corruption of his father and the core of his ideology through his position as king, being the vessel to carry on their legacy, he made this choice of once again forcing his hand around the bond he had with a friend. He didn't want to, but because of how his peers have altered his perception, he felt like he had to. And the line that comes after this action confirms it. Now look what you've made me do. Another instance where we see how much Andrus has been corrupted by his ancestors' ideology is in the episode Olivia and Yunnan, the notorious episode where Andrus allows Marcy to become the major victim of the core as being its new host. As we see Andrus throughout this episode, he seems to have the same conflicts he showed to his father in the past when discussing about Leaf. Just now, it's catered towards Marcy, his new friend. Father, she's not a traitor. She's just worried. But the device hasn't even been tested. 
Surely we should try it on someone else first. Like how he still had a connection to Leaf, Andrew still had a connection with Marcy despite the hatred he had towards her for nearly making him lose everything all over again, which is why he initially tried to defend her, but inevitably ended up following the Korra's orders. Andrus continues to express his tyrannic nature put on him as he has Olivia and Yunnan attend to a task that involves ruining the land and its people. The servants of the king eventually decide to refuse what Andrus asks and to put an end to his madness, and their plan to do so involves Marcy's skills. They soon enough make an attempt to free Marcy after she was in prison and being ready for her true purpose, a frightening purpose that they would soon learn. It actually seemed like they were about to succeed, but Andrus later finds out and stops them in their tracks. The core reveals itself after this and Andrus allows it to take Marcy back for what they had in store for her. The core servants soon tell us that the reason that Marcy had been spared after her fatal wound was because the core demanded that she was to be their new host. But right before Andrus had Marcy be connected to the core, he states this to her. Honestly, Marcy, I like you. Always have. I begged the core to consider an alternative host, but <gasps> alas. This once again is a moment where Andrus' perception of connections with others has been altered by his past and his ancestors. Andrus indeed showed his dedication to his ancestors by doing as they asked and bringing the core a host, which they even used Andrus' personal pride as an edge to have Andrus complete this action, since he states that one of the reasons he let this happen to Marcy is because he had a grudge towards her for getting the best of him in one particular instance. My lord craves a host. And it wanted the best, the smartest, the only one who could beat me at Flipward. <gasps> But, Andrew still showed that he valued his connection to her degree as he tells Marcy that he really wishes the host didn't have to be her. But the device hasn't even been tested. Surely we should try it on someone else first. I begged the core to consider an alternative host. And that's only exemplified as Marcy is crowned with her helmet. Andrew knows he has to let this happen for the hope of continuing his answer's legacy, finally living up to his responsibility, and to fulfill the desire of his masters. But he still cared about the bond he's grown to have with Marcy enough that he couldn't bear to watch the fall of his friend. Cause he's once again been forced to throw away his connection with others for the good of his crown and the expectations placed on him. When the process finally ends, Andrus now has another physical figure to serve, another person to ensure that he fulfills his purpose of legacy. And that's shown as he gives the core their introduction, to show that despite them being in the smaller physical form, he is still loyal to their cause and their pride. The time has finally come for the core to lead us to our destiny. But what destiny you ask? Well, I suppose I should just let it speak for itself. Why, hello there. When we see the events that occur in the present, back in the core of the king, as we witness how Andrus has come to serve the core with their newly acquired host, or now as they're called, Darcy, we see that Andrus still shows a sign of connection yet resentment to the friends he once had by bringing attention to that same painting he had made all those years ago, and the core notices this and continues to toy with Andrus because of it. Maybe we're not the only ones who need to let go of old memories. Nonsense. The past means nothing to me. I personally found this moment very interesting for Andrews' character, since he claims that the past meant nothing to him, which he proved by initially scarring the painting he made in the past. But it wasn't until the core once again mentions that they somewhat despise how Andrews still seems to care about his past connections, that he finally does them justice and burns the painting. This moment is intriguing to me since Andrews could have burned the painting years, decades, or even centuries before this, but he chose not to do the action until he was once again reminded by Darcy, or specifically his ancestors of why he initially had a hatred towards it in the first place. The painting was first made as a symbol of the strength of the bond that he had with his past friends, the symbol that he, himself, physically and emotionally scarred. So by still having that part of him thinking he needed to keep the painting after all these years, this may be as a way to say that despite the resentment he had towards Leaf and Beryl for betraying and failing him as their king, he possibly still had that part of him that valued the time he had with them before those unfortunate events. So, by scarring with his own hands, but not completely destroying it, the painting would still act as a reminder of his past relationships with his long-lost friends, but still express his anger after what they did towards his crown. But, like how his father manipulated him to push his friends away before in years past, Darcy once again pushes Andrews to finally get rid of it so he can only focus on living up to his crown and their desire for conquest. 
However, even though his father, the core, and the expectations of his ancestors force him to push away those connections he once had, and he actually listens to Agree, there's still that smallest part of him that just refuses to move past them, the heart of that prince that still valued his bonds. And we see that as he watches the painting turn to ashes. Despite him being pushed to do this action to remove himself from his past connections, destroying the very thing that he was meant to show how much he cared about them, he still hears Leaf's words echo in his mind. We have your back. Together we can use your power for good. Andrew shows a face of deeply considering his words, as if he really did want to do what his friend wanted. But after looking at how far he's come from that statement, the sight that he once again gave up a bond with someone he could call a friend to live up to the expectations placed on him for the core and his crown, he just breathes a sigh of disappointment towards himself, cause he knows that he can no longer live up to the words of his past companion. All he could do now is serve as a reborn master. Andrew continues to give in to the what Darcy expects of him as he does as they ask in helping them remove some of Marcy's memories and also submits to their legacy of conquest through these words. Who's ready to finally start invading Earth? Ready? After a thousand years, I've thought of nothing else. Andreas, as he delivers this line, doesn't exactly sound thrilled about finally getting the opportunity to fulfill the mission assigned to him centuries ago, the one thing that he's waited for over a thousand years to accomplish. The tone that he, and specifically Keith David, shows for this line seems to imply that he's tired of everything he's done to be where he is. He just wants this all to be over, to just have it be done with. And at the mention of these words from Andreas, Darcy smiles, and responds while slowly showing that it's Aldrich, his father speaking to him, saying, Why, son, I think I'm almost proud of you. Not am proud of you. I'm almost proud of you. Aldrich, for his response to Andreas after finally mentioning that he's thought of nothing else but getting the chance to finally complete their conquest, sees that Andreas just might be coming the son he's expected to be, the next king of carrying their legacy of tyranny, but he still has yet to prove it. Then we come to the big and breaking point moment of Andreas' tyranny, the massive climax episode of the series, All In. This is the episode where Andrus and his army, through the new confidence of the chorus gained after having a new host, finally are able to open a portal to Earth and attempt to conquer it, the chance for Andrus to finally redeem himself for not doing the assignment centuries before. In this climatic episode, we see that Andrus is still willing to honor his loyalty to the chorus since he shows he has support in its cause of the invasion, but like in the core and the king, he still is unable to move past the connections he has despite the chorus big's efforts to force him to push him away, as we witness that Andrus, while watching the conquest of Earth occur, Reminiscence of the time when he had first met Marcy, the first time in his position as king that someone's willing to be his friend, that someone is able to make him smile and laugh. Andrus, when first seeing Marcy's personality, immediately grew liking to her since he sees her sense of kindness and just how innocent she was, despite knowing that she was possibly one of the heroes that are destined to defeat him. But Andrus didn't expect one of those heroes to be so young or high spirited. He even kind of lied to Marcy about them trying to find her friends so that he wouldn't ruin the innocence he sees in her. Speaking of my friends, have you seen them? I need to make sure they're okay. We haven't, but we are looking. Liar! Andrus was actually so thrilled of how nice and adventurous Marcy was in the view moment seeing her, that he gave her a place to stay in his castle, so that she wouldn't be alone in her time in the city. And as she walks away, we see that Andrus greatly appreciates the gift that Marcy had given to him from this interaction. But it's also revealed in this glimpse of the not too long past that Andrus was also put in another conflict because of his connections versus the expectations placed on him. After first meeting Marcy and seeing how innocent and friendly she is, specifically towards him, the court demanded that Andrus kill her since keeping her alive would be a risk to their plans as she was one of the three stars stated in the prophecy. The prophecy that could bring an end to their reign over the amphibia. However, Andrus, still having a slight interest for Marcy, friendly nature makes a defense towards the core in Marcy's case saying it's true the own prophecy makes keeping her alive risky but my lord she's just a child perhaps all of this is overblown showing us that even after all this time being the tyrant his ancestors want him to be through his position as king he still has the heart of that prince in him that can recognize fond connections and innocence within others Kor then asks what they should do if Andrus insists on keeping Marcy alive if he wants to still live up to his chance of redemption for his failure centuries before and this is where Andrus finds a loophole 
He convinces the Corps that there's a chance that they won't have to kill Marcy to receive her and her friend's power in order to use it for their desire of conquest. Which is the series of events that we, the audience, watch play out throughout the show's second season. And the Corps eventually agrees to his plan. But, despite Anders showing his ancestors and the Corps that he's still loyal to their cause of conquest in this moment, they still ensure that Anders remembers their pressure on him as they take the form of his father, Aldrich, the man that had put him in all this in the first place, to tell him, Well done. Andrus was lucky in this situation. He got away with ensuring that he wouldn't have the chance of losing Marcy, the person that for the first time in a thousand years showed him a sign of friendship, but also having a sense of fulfilling his ancestors' responsibility of continuing their legacy of conquest, as he would still live up to their lust for power by getting the very thing they need to do so. After learning this insight of Andrus's and Marcy's first meeting, we then jump back to the present, and we see that despite all that he's gone through with his new human friend, how much he actually seemed to enjoy Marcy's company, he still was pressure enough to show his loyalty to the core and his ancestors as he allows them to lead the charge on Earth's invasion, even though they now bear the face of his former and innocent companion. Through how massive the influence the core has on him, despite him still having a bit of guilt for leaving all his connections behind, Andrus has shown to still willingly do as Darcy asks of him. As we later see as they demand, Andrus sets out to challenge Anne to help the war effort, and he does fall back into a bit of his lasting rage with this order as there indeed is some bad blood between him and Anne after the events of True Colors. Another instance of his ancestors taking advantage of his personal pride. And, fueled by her determination to save both Earth and Amphibia, gives into Andrus' call to action and accepts his challenge. The battle goes back and forth between Amphibia's champion and the Quora's puppet. And as they do, Anne addresses to the audience. <coughs> oh! <coughs> excuse me. I mean, to Andrus, all the flaws of his actions that got him here. I'm supposed to give up? Stop feeling things? Like you? Honestly, I pity you. You shut yourself off and the rest of the world did it you! A thousand years of suffering, of burying your feelings, of hating yourself. That must have been hard. Despite her best efforts, even striking a nerve as Andrews is shown to be genuinely enraged at Anne's words, and at the sight that Anne actually has a chance to win, Anne eventually grows weak after losing her powers for so long, and Andrews finally sees an opportunity to end this. However, Sprig comes to defend his friend, and Andrus sees this as a way to be done with both jobs that he couldn't finish before. Andrus was set on living up to what the core ordered by bringing an end to Anne and her friend, finally bringing an end to the one thing that would stand his way of redemption. But, there was one thing that got him to completely forget that motive and made him stop in his tracks. The mention of Leaf's name and her letter. The mention that his past friend still has something to say after all these years of them being apart. Sprig had obtained the letter from Andrus' lost friend in his home, since it was eventually revealed she was an ancestor to the planters. So to satisfy his curiosity, and as a way to possibly stop Andreas, Sprig reads the letter to the tyrant. My dearest Andreas, this, this message, message may never, never reach, reach you, but I hope it does. I know you must hate me, but please hear me out. After hiding the music box on Earth, I knew I could never return to the kingdom. Change was scary, and it was hard for me to open my heart to others again. But I'm glad I did. We spend our lives afraid of change, but after many years I realized the beauty of life is the change. And through it all, I had such wonderful memories of you. For even though you, Beryl, and I are no longer together, the two of you never really left my side. In the end, my only remaining wish is that somehow, someday, my love reaches you. So I'm begging you, my dearest friend, don't close yourself off. Open your heart and follow it. With love always, your leaf. From the words of Leaf's letter, Andrus is in disbelief that despite everything he did towards Leaf, trying to capture her, drove her away from the kingdom, and constantly having that resentment towards her for her actions, to the point that he even admits he did everything he could to try to forget her, she never forgot him. Leaf up until the very end still consider Andrus a friend, and still believe throughout this time separated from him that he still has the heart to show someone the love that he showed her. Andrus was in so much shock from this revelation that he had to remove his helmet just to see for himself that the letter, Leaf's message, was actually real, and breaks into tears at the sight that it truly is. It was through these touching words from his long lost friend that Andrus begins to break down, reflects, and reminds himself how much he actually cared about her. At this moment, Andrus didn't even care about the fight with Anne or fulfilling the Korra's orders anymore. All he could think about now is that it was too late. 
that he wished he could have been better, could have lived up to what his friend wanted him to be. It was through these words of Leaf reminding him what made him such a good friend to have at her side, that Andrus finally realizes just how much of a monster he's become, and there's nothing that he could do to change the centuries worth of tyranny he's done because of how he fell for the core's influence and his ancestors' pride. But you're too late. The things I've done, the pain I've caused, there's no going back! back, back. The core eventually notices Andrus' sympathy and forces him to push it away to keep fighting, continuing to have command over him to do as they say by replying, We are all you need. We are all you will ever have. Andrus was just about to do as the core says as he ready himself to face Anakin, but from the inspiration of his friend's possibly last words, the reminder of how much he values all the connections he's gained, he thinks to himself, not this time. He's caused enough pain, he's done enough damage, to himself, his friends, to his people, and he's been a tool of his ancestors' tyranny for long enough. He opens his armor, exposing himself, and finally was willing to accept the one thing he's been running from for years. Punishment. Andrus was now defeated, and he accepts that he lost, while showing how much he actually sacrificed through his life as is revealed that Andrus was a cyborg, a sign of how much he gave up for the cause of living up to his ancestors' expectations of him. However, after receiving this damage from Anne's blow, he doesn't ask for help to get up, he doesn't call out for revenge, no. What's the first thing he does after this defeat? He looks to Anne, the person that before this he looked at as his greatest rival, and asks as if it was with his dying breath. I see. You you must save Marcy. To save Marcy. To save his friend. To free her from the core's hold over her. Free her of his past actions of tyranny. And Anne continues to be successful in his request as her and Sasha bring an end to Darcy and free their friend, bringing the ultimate stop to the attack on Earth. With Andrus's and the later core's defeat, the invasion eventually comes to a close as they return everyone to Amphibia to bring its citizens the news that they were successful in preventing the conquest of Earth, that they were now free of the corrupted tyranny that plagued their land. Andrus continues on with accepting this loss, but the core doesn't, as a final attempt to not give up on their legacy of power starts its ultimate plan, to crash the moon into Amphibia, the very thing that Leaf had foretold in her vision. Andreas, seeing that what Leaf said was finally coming true, realizes in these frightening moments that he should have always listened to her, to have never pushed her away. But Andreas does help in trying to stop the Core's plan by telling the girls of what the Core is exactly doing, and they realize that they may be the ones that could stop it for their gift of wielding the powers of the box and the gems. Soon enough, the girls are turned into their calamity forms and take to the stars to finish this, once and for all. The Fallen King now watches as the girls fight back against the Core's final effort to still reign as a god. The battle between the Core and the stars of power as told to legends rages on throughout the sky, and all Andrews can do is watch and see what may be the ultimate outcome of what decides all their fates. But then, he hears someone call his name. Andreas, Father, help us. Save us. And you can finally join us forever. The core, for the first time throughout the course of the show, asks Andrus not to serve him, but to help him, because it knows it can't stand too much of a chance against the full power of the box in the hands of its chosen wielders. And from how it initially seemed, Andrus actually was about to do what they asked. But through the encouragement of Lee's words, what he's gone through with his past friends and Marcy, how much he regrets pushing them away, and realizing how much pain he's caused because of the influence through his father and the core, he makes a final decision of himself and chooses to put an end to the reign of the core over him and all. Amphibia. He does as his father of the core demands and sends his robots out to fulfill the command. But in a noble twist to show his changed outlook, his robots actually help the girls fight back. With everything that we've seen him gone through, pressured by his father and his ancestors' legacy, befriending Marcy, and learning at least final words towards him, Andrus was finally fighting for his people rather than against them. The core demands for Andrus to explain why he's doing this, what he would gain from all this, and replies with the final nail in the coffin to show that he is through with his direct nature. What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago, standing up to you! Now, I guess I should say this now, since I'm not sure if I'll ever talk about this scene again, but as great as I find this moment is for Andrus's character, it kind of feels a bit dragged down with Andrus's lines, since it's literally just a recycled line from season 1. What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago, standing up to you! <laughs> what are you doing? 
something I should have done a long time ago. Standing up to you! People can consider this a parallel with certain events, but I just think it's still kind of a missed opportunity to make what Andrew says slightly different to Barasui's position as a king figure. But that still doesn't mean that this moment doesn't carry some significant weight, specifically with his action of destroying his crown. As I look back at the show, I started to sort of interpret Andrew's crown as a representation of the power that the core has over Andrew's and the past rulers of Amphibia, like Aldrich and their ancestors. This can kind of fall back to true colors while Andrus is wearing it when he reveals his true nature to the girls. Throughout the scene of him showing our protagonist what he intends to do now that the box has returned to him, he continues to act the way the core expects him to, as the tyrant they need in order to fulfill their wish of conquest. But it wasn't until Andrus respected him as a king and lost his crown that he completely shifts his focus from his mission to get this simple glory of revenge against Anne. Without the crown in the picture, Andrus is so consumed by his personal pride, not the pride of the core, that he only focused his attention on Anne to get back at her for disrespecting him. But that's what led to the box being stolen again under his watch. We didn't even realize it at the time, but this shows to us that the crown, the connection that he has to the core, is really what's keeping him on track to live up to the expectations of his ancestors and their legacy, and we see the continuous control that the core has over Andrus through that crown as the show went on. The core had demanded that Andrus kill Marcy at the first sight of her, however, Andrus had cut his thinking to work around this demand to spare his new friend's life, but still had to live up to the core's expectations since they were the ones that he literally looked up to. It was by the core's orders that Andrus would make Marcy be their new host, forcing him to once again sacrifice his connections with others for the sake of serving them and their desires. And the final bow, the core used that crown to force Andrus to put aside his emotions and to ensure that he would not stumble or falter in doing their bidding. So, by having this moment Andrus finally removing the crown of his own terms, and to finally have the strength to destroy it, can be a way to show that Andrus has had enough of his past of playing a puppet for his ancestors' greed of conquest, and willing to be the one to finally put an end to this era of their tyranny. The final battle plays out and the girls, Amphibious Torsen Warriors, were victorious in saving the land, and Andrus believes a sigh of relief in finally seeing that least fear for Amphibious' future is destroyed. It was all finally over. Soon enough, the girls had come to the point that they had to say goodbye to all their amphibian friends, and we see Andrus sulking in the distance and looking down on himself as he wasn't expecting any rewards for what he's done. Even though he chose to help the girls fight the core in the final battle, nothing could change to what he did before this while under the core's influence, what he's done to his people as their king, how he still forced away all the bonds he's gained that he was still a monster. But Marcy, willing to see the good in his heart after helping her, Sasha, and Anne in their final battle, gently being her friend before these unfortunate events, and despite how harshly he treated her because of what the core demanded of him, she still gave Andrus a friendly goodbye. We see on Andrus' face in response to Marcy's farewell that he was surprised and grateful that she still acknowledged him at their last possible moment together. However, he still showed resentment towards himself for what he's done to her by looking away, but still expresses generosity towards his new friend sympathy because of these words saying that he shouldn't close his heart to others, which led to him to respond with, Take care, kiddo. He knows he can't take back what he did to her, but through the words of Leaf to not force his connections away again, he still hopes that even though he's caused so much trouble towards his friend, that she can still find her path and be happy despite how he treated her. The girls eventually take their inevitable leave from Amphibia, and as they do, the abusive box withers away. Not only showing that this is indeed the last time our human protagonist will interact with the Amphibian people, but also extinguishing Andrus' ancestors' lust for conquest because of it, finally putting an end to the tyrannic and grief-filled control over the people of Amphibia. After everything that's happened to Andrus throughout the show, the awful actions he's done under his crown, recognizing the flaws in his tyrannic nature, and finally putting an end to his corrupted past of power, we see how he's come to terms with it all in the end. He's accepted the error of his ways while being under the influence of his ancestors as king, and finally he sets aside his pride for the throne and gives it up for the people. When we see Andrus after the time skip to see how both worlds have changed, he is now helping regrow their home. He's old, he's changed, and overall seems happy to be where he is. Because in this moment, we don't see a king hunting for conquest like in the rest of the show. We see a man now trying to live a quiet, simple life after reflecting on himself. He's retired his royal armor. He now uses his robots that once were used to dominate to help grow this new world, and it finally is able to put the pain of his family's expectations behind him. I also think it's important to notice that despite us knowing that Andrus is a cyborg, meaning that it may be possible for him to actually repair himself after the onslaught of a final blow that he received from Anne, at this last glimpse of him we see on the show, it seems he 
chose not to repair his damage from the final battle. This decision can really be left up for interpretation, so this is simply just how I see it. But it could possibly be a way to symbolize that he's moved past his desire of redemption, and is now willing to carry on the scars of his past actions. As stated in the aftermath of receiving his injuries in All In, he said that he had these additions to his body in order to live for a thousand years, which was to ensure that he actually got to live to see himself fulfill his promise to his father that he would do everything he can to fix the mistake of ruining his family's legacy. So now that he doesn't have to live up to the expectation placed on him anymore, he has no reason to continue on with this artificial life. He actually comes to rest, enjoy simpler sides of this world, and for probably the first time in centuries, he feels at peace. Even when taking a closer look at his eyes, it shows his aging. Matt Brawley on Twitter even pointed out this is because through his time after the events of the core being stopped, he slowly started to lose his vision, which alongside all his other scars, shows that he's come to term with his mortality, which to me is an important piece to his character in these final moments. Throughout the time that we see Andrus and the core together in the show, one of the big ways the core motivates Andrus to do as they command is with the mention that only if Andrus fulfills their orders that he can receive the chance to join them, to join their controlled consciousness, to join them in eternity. Since Andrus has stated in early episodes that the core was a way for him and his ancestors to conquer death. This was the same temptation that they actually used against Andrus to ensure that he would have the drive to defeat Ann. Oh, and Andrus, if you fail, you can forget about ever joining your father and the rest of us up here. You hear me, Ann? It's time for a rematch! But, now that we see Andrus has moved past that desire of immortality through the influence of the core, he's come to terms that he is immortal, he accepts his wounds, and he accepts that one day, he'll pass on from this world, just like all his friends have. It's also in this look of Andrus' farm life that we see he now actually seems happy to carry the symbols of the connections he's gained throughout his journey. He now uses Beryl's hammer as a cane, putting his trust in it to help him walk the zoo path after choosing not to repair his leg, showing that he's managed to move on from his distrust of Beryl for failing him in the past. If we look closely at his cloak, he wears two significant symbols, the first being a leaf that bears a strong resemblance to the one that his friend leaf wore with her time at Andrus' side, showing that he's grown past her reactions towards him. Now that he knows that despite his harsh attitude towards leaf he had because of his father's and ancestors' expectations of him, leaf still considered him a friend and an important part of her life. With how he now holds a part of her with him, it comes a way to show that she mattered just as much to him as he did to her, and he won't make that mistake of trying to forget her again. The second symbol well as Cloak is the charm that Marcia gifted to him when she first met Andrews after initially arriving in Amphibia. To show that even though he forced Marcia to go through so much pain, the fact that Marcia was willing to tell him a friendly goodbye, and from hearing the words of Leaf in her letter to not close his heart to others, he listened to her words and came to greatly appreciate the chance of finally finding another person he could call a friend the first time he ever had a friend throughout his time as king for the past thousand years. So he carries on Marcy's pin as a reminder of all those wonderful memories he had with her, and hope that she's finding her path just like he's finding his. The fact that he's now come to be proud to bear these trinkets of his connections shows how he's free from the expectations of his ancestors and their legacy. Now that he stood up to his father and his ancestors' greed and influence over him, he doesn't push away or exploit his connections anymore but embraces them and feels proud to have them instead. He may have had a troll of past, and even resents himself for what he's done under the influence of his crown, but as we see him in the end as he reflects on it all, he still manages to conjure a smile, because despite all the pain he's caused, he's glad that he finally found the courage to stand up to his ancestors' legacy of power, the source of his corruption, and that the ones he's come to make attachments with still managed to find their way of living a meaningful life despite his harsh nature towards them. Lee found a caring life with the people of Wartwood, and even told that she died happy because Andrews got to pee a part of her life. Marcy, despite Andrews literally stabbing her in the back and forcing her to become the victim of his ancestors' plans, still express a friendly farewell to him before leaving Amphibia, because before all those unfortunate events of his ancestors' influence, she still had a blast at his side due to how Andrus made it all really feel like an adventure to her, the feeling that they really shared a bond, that she really did have him as a friend. Andrus, before being forced by his father to follow his family's path of tyranny, greatly appreciated connections he had in his life, expressing them as some of the greatest parts of being where he is, but due to the expectations of Aldrich and the core being pressured on him, he was corrupted to either throw those connections away or or to use them as a way to benefit himself or his family's plans, which ultimately is what led him to losing all those connections and hurting the people he cared about. However, despite everything he's done, after all the trouble he's caused, in these final moments of us seeing him on the show, he could die happy knowing he still managed to touch the lives of the people around him, even if it was so few. 
No matter how hard his peers tried to push down his caring nature, how hard they pressured him with his position as king, deep down, there was always that smallest speck of the loving, hopeful prince beneath it all. It just took the reminder of just how much he cared about his connections with others that he finally remembered that there still was that caring prince in him all along. Andrews learned that it was because of his ancestors' influence over him that Amphibia had become the wasteland we see it turned into. But now that he's free from that influence, he's willing to take responsibility for it, and slowly but surely, helps rebuild this world he calls home with his own hands, which in his eyes now, he should have done all along. Andrews, by the time we see the show end, is no longer carrying on the legacy of his ancestors. He's forging his own legacy, and through all his reminders of his connections he's gained on his journey, he knows what his legacy wants to be. To be the person that not his family, but his land, his people, his friends, and his home truly needed. This is Brax Warmer, and this has been Andrus's Legacy.